I'm Shirley. I'm Seymour. This is what it's like to be married for 69 long, long years. <laughs> Didn't need all that. <laughs> what does it take to stay together for such a long time? Today you'll hear stories and advice from Shirley and Seymour and two other couples who've been married for over 50 years, like Emery and Vivian Smith. Be yourself. Yeah. Respect and love and trust. Yeah. Yes. You've got you've to gotta have trust. You don't trust each other, then you you don't you don't have very much. And Angela and Grant Lovenbrook. You just really have to love each other all the time, even when you don't. There are gonna be lots of times when you won't like each other very much, but you do have to love each other. I'm Kyone Wolf. Love and marriage and longevity. That's next on Audacious, after the news. Hey, it's Kayone. This is a special fundraising edition of Audacious. So later you're going to hear some of my friends from the station pop in to ask you to contribute to the show. And I want you to know that I have really loved working on Audacious since it launched back in June. And I also want to assure you that the folks who run our membership campaigns, they take note of every pledge during every show to see what kind of support that show has. So please show them that you're an Audacious member of Connecticut Public and grab a brand new audacious branded mug while you're at it at ctpublic.org slash donate. Thank you so much. And enjoy meeting these amazing couples who've been married for a combined 190 years. Here we go. From Connecticut Public Radio in Hartford, this is Audacious. I'm Kyone Wolf. Fill in the blank. Love is patient, kind. Love is work, hard to find. But if you want to put your finger on what makes up long-lasting love, you're going to need some wisdom to fill in those blanks. So today, meet three couples who've been together for over 50 years. We get started with college sweethearts Angela and Grant Levenbrook. I met them for the first time this week when they joined me via Zoom from their home in Rockport, Maine. I asked them to take me back to when they first met, over 55 years ago. Well, we uh, we met at the University of Buffalo. Grant had a job in the woman's dormitory. So this is how old we are. I went to college at a time when women had curfews. So Grant's job was to sit behind the desk and sign people in and out. And one of his other jobs was to, on the ground floor of the dormitory, there were these cubbies where you could take your guests. So he had to check the cubbies to make sure that you were, if you were in there with a guy, you were, had both feet on the floor. You had to have both feet on the floor. So that was his job. And, <laughs> and that's how I met him. And he was very cute and very funny and chatty. I played the piano for him. Do you remember what song it was? I played Misty. Of course you did. Well, <laughs> of course. I played, that's what I played. And then we didn't actually date until my sophomore year. I was walking down a sidewalk and I saw him and he was so cute. He had jeans on. I still can see him walking towards me, dark hair. And he got up to me and this is what he said to me. He said, a kiss would be a boon. And I kissed him. And then several weeks- I don't know where I got all these things from. (laughs) And then several weeks later, I went to a fraternity party with a friend of his, but I came home with him. The next day was Sunday, and he called me, and he asked me if I wanted to go with him. He's from Rochester, New York. It's about an hour from Buffalo. And he asked me if I wanted to go have lunch with his parents. And so he came to pick me up. I still know what he had on that day. And when we were in the car, he called me sweetheart. And when he called me sweetheart, I thought to myself, I have never been this comfortable with a boy, a man, in my entire life. And two weeks later, I proposed. You did. You know, when you, you realize you've never said I love you to anyone, and you've never felt it, you don't want to pass up this opportunity. I never knew anybody like him. I came from Scranton, Pennsylvania, from a very close Italian family. And he, he wrote poetry. He was a historian. He played music. He was an artist. He was cute. He was a good kisser. <laughs> I liked him a lot. And I, I loved her lots. And what I found out early in my life with her was that 
it seemed like I was the most dominant and uh, strong and experienced of the two. And the more time went on, I realized I wasn't. <laughs> she was the uh, the smart cookie, and uh, <clears throat> she was just so special and powerful, kind of woman that uh, starts things, doesn't follow things. She was uh, giving testimony before the United States Senate Committee on Aging with Ralph Nader as a young woman. You must see younger people dating now on their cell phones. They've got apps. There's websites to match people up. People are marrying later in life. They're having fewer kids. Divorce is not nearly as taboo as it once was. What do you think about how people are finding each other now? I'm glad. I don't think I would like that so much. I mean, it was chance, you know, I, I'm Scranton, Pennsylvania, and here's this guy. And, Upstate New York. You know, what are the chances? Guy. So I, I also think that, that young people sometimes, not always, but sometimes the first sign of trouble, that's the end of that, you know, and we learned a lot about forgiveness. We sure learned a lot about forgiveness and yeah, for sure going down roads where you were really unhappy and miserable with each other for a period of time. And then somehow the roads intertwined. And at that point you say, well, it was hard getting to this spot, but we're here. And so let's deal with that. So I'm going to give you a postscript. Uh, after years of courting a, uh, a bone marrow disease, which has now turned into cancer, I, I got to deal with the fact that I'm dying. And this woman here won't let me escape any of the feelings. She's not, she's not sitting there whining and crying and in her soup. She's fine making sure that I cover it all. I may be uh, maybe not around if you don't do this program pretty soon. I may not be around for it. But uh, uh, I'm a fighter, and she's a double fighter. So... The fact of the matter is, uh, I probably make it past the six months that my doctor has given me. He's been really sick the last six months, especially, and now is really bad. And we feel like things have come home to roost, you know, what we put into the 55 years. And I said to somebody today that for 50 some years, this is the first face I see in the morning and the last face I see at night. And I like that. So she also knows how to put her foot on my uh, keister. Just saying. <laughs> I wonder, dealing with your illness, have you been able to be there for each other because of how you've built this marriage, or have you had to learn new stuff now too? I'm, we're learning new stuff every day. It's a uh, eye opener. Uh, it's a funny kind of disease because you're just uh, walking around like a tired, tired all the time. And you want to do more and you want to, you know, I was an ardent golfer and a uh, tennis player and a kayaker and, and I haven't been able to do any of that stuff. So without a woman who is not totally supportive, I'd have been uh, up the creek without a paddle. I don't know if it's instinctive or... I mean, we've had a lifetime of kind of caring about and for each other. And so picked up, picked up a lot of tricks. <laughs> How often and in what ways do you talk about death? The practicalities we've just been starting to talk about, you know, life insurance. And I mean, we've had life insurance. We've had a will. You know, we had a recommendation for hospice. And so initially, I mean, Grant's response was, I'm not there yet. You know, I don't want hospice. He's still fighting and doesn't, we don't think we need hospice just yet, but you have to talk about it because there are, there are definitely practical things that have to be handled. Pall palliative care. Do you ever hear that? That's what we're getting now is palliative care. And it's, so, so we, we, we had a talk today about, um, expectations and regrets and, they're not easy conversations, but in the middle of the night, we talk sometimes about that. I'd rather well, sleep myself. <laughs> sleep. I kind of am pushing at him. A little bit, a little bit. I need, I need it. But it's only when you get to this point do you realize 
what the hell you've been sitting with for 55 years. And uh, it's, you knew it it, it's sinking in. You knew it. You use a lot of humor to get through. Talk about humor in your relationship. Humor, uh, well, I practiced for 42 years as a child and family therapist. And if you didn't have humor and the ability to laugh at yourself and other people, it, kids uh, didn't, didn't relate. Right now, point in my life, I'm getting kids, former patients of mine, writing to me. They somehow picked up on what I'm going through and telling me about how important I was to them. It's been really enlightening to him to hear from people, even friends of our kids saying, you know, you, you sat and talked to me in the kitchen that time and you said stuff to me and I use that with my own kids now and I want to thank you. So it's been very good for him to hear. And by the way, I haven't cried for anybody, so consider yourself special. <laughs> I cherish being a tough cookie. And funny. And funny. He uses humor sometimes to deflect, however. You know, when it's getting too close and too tight, he'll make, he'll crack a joke. Angela. Yes. What does Grant do that makes you smile? Oh, my gosh. Some of his jokes I've heard too many times. (laughs) But... (laughs) He still says things that surprise me or that make me laugh. He, he's just a funny, perceptive guy. And um, he's always made me laugh. Nothing in particular. He just has a way of, um, of um, observing something. And throwing in a good punchline. Throwing what the in hell? a good punchline. So I like being around him. Grant, what about you? What does Angela do to make you smile? Not hit me. <laughs> Come on. I'm just saying, I'm just saying. I remember times when we were at a camp for special needs kids and we were just uh, falling deeper and deeper in love. And uh, I realized that I had never said I love you to another woman. <laughs> Number one. Can't pass that up. What do you think some of the ingredients are? that go into a really long lasting marriage, like some of those kernel fundamentals? Perseverance, forgiveness. He gave me freedom. And I don't mean that in the sense that he gave me something that I didn't have, but he certainly as a woman and and as a woman who came from a, from a stricter background, he, he was, absolutely willing to let me do and be whatever I wanted to be. He gave me that freedom and that, and supported it. And so for me as a woman, that was essential. I wouldn't have another woman in my life who wasn't powerful. And this kid was powerful. Went way past me. Testifying before Congress, you know, uh, starting the earliest practices in audiology in the country, uh, stuff that I was proud of. And I didn't say, slow down. I said, go get them. Right? You did. Thank you. He did. <laughs> he did. And, and, um, and he was there for the kids and for me. So I think that support and certainly perseverance. I just got married. What's your advice for me, for us? You have to, this is stupid, but you just really have to love each other all the time, even when you don't. There are going to be lots of times when you won't like each other very much, but you do have to love each other. I keep saying it, but forgiveness, because you're going to do bad things to each other. We did bad things to each other. We were cruel. We said bad things to each other. He forgave me and I forgave him. And we endured. And that's endurance. Keep that word in mind. Endurance. Okay, sweetie. Well, thank you so much for talking with me. It's it's been a true honor speaking with you both. And I wish you lots of peace and comfort. It was rather illuminating for us too. You got him to say things he hasn't been saying. 
<laughs> what the hell? Good for you. <laughs> love you, dear. Right. Bye -bye. Love you too. Bye. Bye. I feel like I'm clinging to a cloud. I can't understand. I get misty just holding your hand. That was Angela and Grant Lovenbrook of Rockport, Maine, married for 55 years. After the break. Well, I was sitting at the piano, and this woman came in, this spirit came in, and I knew that was for me. She didn't know it, but I knew it. I'm Kyone Wolf. This is Audacious. Stay with me. I get misty the moment you're near. I'm Betsy Kaplan. I'm the senior producer for The Colin McEnroe Show, and I'm here with Katie Talarski, the senior director of storytelling and radio program here at Connecticut Public. And I have a feeling that if you're listening to Kion Wolf, um, you really love what you're hearing. Kion's new podcast is one of the more popular podcasts on Connecticut Public right now, and I'm sure that I can understand why. Um, as working on The Colin McEnroe Show, I've worked with Kion many years on that show, and I know um, how much people love her and how talented she is. And this is a terrific show, Katie. I don't know. I know you listen to it. And I know, Katie, you help her edit a little bit with um, Audacious. But what a wonderful show. I mean, it's the kind of show that we all like to hear, but we don't necessarily hear very much on public radio. Just the human experience of other people, different from our own. I love her sort of behind the screens thing, you know, um, where she talks about like, uh, like Schitt's Creek, the costume design on that. And it's just uncomfortable topics sometimes that we all think about and want to talk about, but we don't really like to talk about them in public. So I think it's a terrific, brand new, wonderful, refreshing show. Um, so give us a call at, I'm going to, you know, what, I'm going to give you WNPR.org uh, first, because more people donate, I think, through the web than they do through the phone. So WNPR.org, or if you prefer, give us a call at 1-800-584-2788. That's right. Hi, Betsy. Good to be here with you and to be here with um, all of you listening to Audacious along with us. Uh, this is an excellent episode. This is um, an episode where we're listening to people who have been married, for interviews with people who have been married for um, more than 50 years. And this episode definitely made me like get choked up because it's just beautiful like reflections on relationships and reflections on love and life and the reality of it and um, it is a great example of what Kion is doing with Audacious just getting these personal stories it's it's um, getting to know people a little bit more getting to know about things that we maybe think we know about but don't totally understand so I've had a blast working with Kion on um, Audacious. Um, I've been working with Kion, you know, for 13 or so years here at Connecticut Public. So it's been fun to sort of watch her grow into this role as host. And she's, um, you know, she's just amazing to work with and has so much energy and so many ideas. And again, you are, um, as a listener, are, are, enjoying that. You're getting to um, sort of reap the benefits of that. So we hope you appreciate the programming. Um, we hope you appreciate Audacious and Kion Wolf and her brain and her curiosity. Uh, please call us now and support it during this February membership campaign, 1-800-584-2788. Again, that's 1-800-584-2788. Betsy, I can't not give the phone number first. It's like drilled into my brain, but I, it is true that more people do go to wnpr.org slash donate and uh, contribute there. But do it now. Help support the programming. 1-800-584-2788. Yeah, you know, Katie, just in you talking about Kion's enthusiasm and energy for the show, I stood next to her for many years. Um, we haven't seen each other for a bit due to the pandemic. But I know how enthusiastic and how long she has tried to get this show on the air. She had the seed of this idea a very long time ago. And I know that, you know, many people, including Katie, along the way have helped her develop that idea as it's gone along. But since she even started this show, she's grown so much and the show gets better every week. Um, I know the show that, you, you know, the show that we're listening to now also brought tears to my eyes and I've been married 31 years. So I have a little bit of a sense of what that means to be in a really long-term relationship, although not that long. And um, it's really impressive and interesting to hear about. You know, I, I was riveted. I've been riveted a number of times, this show about tat having your tattoo removed, the show about antinatalism, egg donation, surrogacy. These are shows that are riveting because we all want to know about them. We don't really get a chance to talk about them in public. And Kion is wonderful at really getting people 
to open up and talk about very sensitive issues. And she has a talent. She was able to do that in the newsroom, always very popular, able to get everybody to chat with her. It's just something that she has and she brings it to the show. So what I'm trying to say is it's been a long time in the making. She's worked really hard to get here. She could use your support. Uh, WNPR.org. I'm setting an example, Katie. <laughs> 584-2788 or go online again at WNPR.org. I don't want to leave Katie with just about 10 seconds left of this break. I'm going to say, if you've already given, give it for the next generation of kids and students who can't yet contribute. WNPR.org and thanks. This is Audacious. I'm Kyone Wolf. Today, love and marriage. Long, long marriages. If you live in Hartford, Connecticut, then you may have heard of legendary jazz pianist Emery Austin Smith. He's been married to his wife, Vivian Ashton Smith, for 65 years. I asked him to take me back. How did they meet? Oh, we met at, uh, in New York City, the borough of Manhattan, and the section they call Harlem. We were at a bar called the Big Apple. I was sitting at the piano, and this woman came in, this spirit came in. And I knew that was for me. She didn't know it, but I knew it. That was the beginning of a beautiful friendship. Vivian, when you first saw Emery, what did you think? He hated me. (laughs) (laughs) He didn't like me. (laughs) I didn't know exactly at that time that he was the one for me, but uh, this was before Christmas and I went home for Christmas. And when I came back, we, we went to a movie. And at that time, I knew, I knew that he was the one for me. What was it about him? He was a gentleman, kind, polite. I felt safe with him. I was comfortable. Emery, what was it about her? There was something there. It was a spirit. And it's hard to explain what that spirit is, what it is, because it's something you can't put your hands on. Will you tell me about the wedding proposal? Well, we were walking down 7th Avenue near uh, between 126, 127th Street, not too far from the Alhambra Hope Movie House Theater, rather. And that's when I asked her to marry me. Wait, did you know, had you planned on asking her before or did it just come to oh, mind? Oh, yeah, but I didn't know when or where, but I knew it was coming that night on 7th Avenue in the heart of Harlem. I'm telling you, that was a great area. Vivian, what did you think when he popped the question? I suppose I was surprised, but I said yes. <laughs> I didn't. I don't believe there was any hesitation about that. No, it really wasn't. How was the wedding planning? Because for some people, planning a wedding is is not that fun, and for some people, it's a lot of fun. How was it for you? But it was so quick. I mean. <laughs> well, that, well, you know, you figure, well, you, you probably nowhere near 65, but 65 years ago, weddings, things are so, <laughs> are so different. Kids today want big, expensive, you know, weddings, and, uh, we, we were just happy to know that we were going to be together and, and, and live our life hopefully out together. So wedding, that wedding that you were talking, thinking we might have had, it never even crossed their mind. But one thing, I I didn't know anyone in 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 my experience who had ever had a a big wedding. Did you have a honeymoon? <laughs> yeah, yes, it's still going did. on. <laughs> oh yeah, it's a great honeymoon. Oh, it's a great life. <laughs> it's a great life. I'm having a ball, even with this. Illness that's going around, sickness that's going around, this pandemic. We, I enjoy being around her. I guess I could be a pain in the neck at times, but I enjoy being <laughs> around her. And we're busy. We're for one thing, we're readers. The other thing, I'm a musician, so uh, that uh, play piano, and so uh, I, I'm having a ball. I've had a ball for the last sixty-five years. Vivian, when. When Emery's playing the piano, what's your favorite thing that he plays? They're all my favorites. It's hard to say what is my favorite. And when we're when he's in a concert and I hear one, I say, oh, yeah, that's nice. I remember that. You know, and you start humming and rocking and you may want to dance. But 
Then when he plays the second one, it's the same thing. It's, and actually, he never plays a tune the same way. So it's like you fall in love with every tune every time you hear it. Emery, is there a song that you love to play for Vivian? Oh, there was one that's written by uh, Hoagie Carmichael. It's called The Nearness of You. There's one song I like, and, it, and it's Thanks for the Memory. Sarah Vaughn had a great recording of it herself. That was a great tune. Now, back to your marriage, I'm wondering to what degree or in what way becoming parents strengthened your marriage and or tested it? Well, we just went out and did it. You and, don't and, think and, about and, what and, it is you have to do. You just know things have to be done. Right. There's no one else to do it but you. So you do it. And sometimes it's great pleasure in it and other times there's stress and discomfort and sadness but at the end of the day you still love each other and, and you're you're able to you've gotten through one day and then you know you'll have to face the whole thing all over again tomorrow it's just a part of life it's a part of living it's a part of marriage vivian i hear from emory a lot of respect for you and a lot of appreciation for what you do and who you are and all you've done. Is that part of what makes your marriage so strong? Yes. Respect and trust. I trust him and I respect him. And of course, I love him and always have and always will. Once I met him, I that was it. I said, I, I, I never want to have anyone else in my life but him. And it's been that way for over 65 years. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, we have our ups and downs, and of course, when you have your downs, then you always think of the things that you wish might have been different or the things you think went wrong. And But at the end of the day, when things cool down, it's, uh, it's, it's back to business as usual, and that means that the love and the respect and the trust is always there. Yeah, that's, that's a big thing. And it wasn't that hard, to tell you the truth. When I look back, it wasn't that hard. We, you, you know, you work through problems, situations. You work through, you work through it. Sometimes it, it, that, it, that angst happens, but you work through it, and, 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 and the love and respect is, is, is there. And that's the thing that keeps things going, because, you know, you can get involved politically. You can have psychological problems, or you can, you can have... Uh, where you think about politics and the way the world is going, the way the world is being run. And what I say, that really doesn't matter because, you know, I have a, a family that's more important than anything else in the world. Where you can enclose yourself within that family structure, feeling of, of love and respect, boy, you got to be. <laughs> I wonder what you think being married this long means to your family. What do they What do they think about this? We have one one child who's who's been married uh, thirty years now, and you know it's like for him, his goal is to stay married as long as possible. He just wants to be married like his mom and his dad have been. So far, Emery and I are the longest married couple that we know. Our longevity in life and marriage means a lot to everyone on both sides of our family, especially the the, uh, the younger ones, because it gives it gives them a goal and it gives them hope that hey, maybe it can happen. It's, it's great for the kids. I just got married on October first, twenty twenty. So I'm wondering if you have any advice for me. Well, first of all, congratulations. Thank you. My nieces on my nieces in law, as some would say, have often said to me, Aunt Vivian, how how come you and Uncle Austin have stayed married so long? And I just look at them and smile because there's nothing that I can tell them that will help them. It's just to say, be yourself. Yeah. Respect and love and trust. Yeah. And you've got to you've got to have trust. You don't trust each other, then you you don't you don't have very much. But congratulations, enjoy 
you'll have you'll find your way. Just just don't be afraid to try to find yeah, the things that make you comfortable, and make you happy. Try to uh, be able to discriminate between trivial and significant things. Edit out the trivial things, because you know there's a lot of triviality that goes with life, and you got to be ready to say, oh, no, no, that's not really that important. But this is important. You know, love and respect is important. Trust is important. But not the bottle of uh, McClellan Scotch, which costs three hundred dollars a bottle. <laughs> How did you know we love Scotch? <laughs> I thought everybody did. <laughs> I thought everybody did. McClellan single malt, three hundred dollars a bottle. well emery and vivian smith i will raise a glass of my finest scotch to your 65 years thank you so much for talking with me thank Thank you you. have a good day bye bye Bye. Bye. that was emery austin smith and vivian ashton smith of the blue hills neighborhood in hartford connecticut they've been married for 65 years when we get back when you start thinking alike and answering for somebody, you know it's <laughs> you know it's a good marriage. What a marriage sounds like after sixty nine years. I'm Kyone Wolf. This is Audacious. Be right back. This is Audacious. I'm Kyone Wolf. I'm Shirley. I'm Seymour. This is what it's like to be married for 69 long, long years. (laughs) Didn't need all that. (laughs) Today we're hearing some wisdom and advice about marriage and other long-term committed relationships. When Shirley and Seymour Reitman met each other, there was no Tinder, no OkCupid, no Twitter, no Facebook. And compared to today totally different expectations about what courtship and marriage should be like. I interviewed them in the before times way back in March of 2019 at their home at Duncaster Retirement Community in Bloomfield, Connecticut. And we started with how they met. Well, we met a couple times. (laughs) He was a senior in high school and I was a freshman. And I belonged to a sorority. He belonged to a fraternity. And the fraternity boys used to come up after our meetings, and we would dance and have refreshments and so forth. Well, I met him then. He forgot me completely. I couldn't remember her. (laughs) So then he went off to the Army. Uh, He came home from the service, and he wanted a date, and he didn't know who to call. So he asked a friend of mine as well as his, and he said, why don't you call Shirley Hammer? He said, uh, that's Hank Rich's kid cousin. So he did. He called me, and we See, talked. The, the problem I had is that the girls I knew had moved away or gotten married, and I just didn't know any of it after, after my World War II service. And it was expected at the time that you get married. <laughs> yes. find somebody. Yes. It wasn't cool to just be single for 50 Especially years. Especially for girls. I got married very young. How old? 20. He was 24. So we went out. We went to a friend's house. Had a great time. He called me again and called me again. And then he went off to Washington and he wrote to me. And that was that. At what point did you realize you were the ones for each other? I don't know what prompted me to get the ring, but. I had 200. I think I said something that I was not dating, and are we going to get engaged or not? I think that's what happened. I bought an engagement ring for two hundred fifty dollars. This is back in nineteen, what forty forty eight was it? Yeah, and uh, took her up on the boardwalk. One night, and I gave her the engagement ring. Now, do you remember what you said? Did you get down on one knee? Did you have something prepared? No. You just said, here's the ring. (laughs) You want it? You know what? We never even thought about it. You know, some people make a big thing of it. It was just 
we went together so long, I guess now it's time yeah. to either get engaged and married or go your separate way. And so how was... long had you been together? No, about a year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How many children do you have? Three. We had three. We had One three. died. Our middle son died. I'm so sorry. Did you always know that you wanted kids? Yes, of course. <laughs> you say, yeah. of course. <laughs> really? Everybody of my vintage felt the same way. Yeah. How can you how can you get married and not have a nice family? Yeah. yeah. That's just the way it That's yeah. the way it was. Do you think that people see marriage differently now? Oh my oh, god, yes. yes. Uh, the stuff you see in the paper, they're in her second and third and third uh, marriage. I would mm. imagine we're probably one, if not the only one, that's still on their first marriage. The people here have been married before. It's either well, a they've second. lost their husband. They've or lost. lost their wife. They've lost a, a mate, and uh, I, ne I never say how long I'm married. Figure it's nobody's business. What do you think has changed? Like, how did we get from an old era that where people, when you get married, that's it, and now, like, what do you think changed? One thing is that children went off to colleges in other cities, and they became their own person. And they met somebody, they didn't know her for a very, maybe they didn't know her very long, and it wasn't such a hot marriage, and they got out of it. But we considered we're together so long. I mean, listen, we fight plenty. If I said we didn't, I'd be telling you a big lie. <laughs> but we make up. Never carry it more than one day. If we're yeah. angry, that's it. Yeah. By the time we go to bed, the, the argument is over. After all this time together, I would imagine you'd run out of things to fight about. But that's not true? No. We, what, New things. What do we fight about? <laughs> yeah. Oh, lots of things. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, we each, stuff all the time, we each have our own opinions on things. He's, you know, always moving things. If I have something one place, he puts it someplace else. It true? depends how I'm feeling. Okay. If I'm in a good mood, I don't get mad. But she's not always in a good mood. Well, because <laughs> what happens is I'll tell him something, and, and I've repeated it over and over and over. He thinks it's brand new, but I, I let him know. I, I'm sick of it. I'm telling you what I want, and that's the end of it. And we what work you, it out. I forget, a, I forget a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so is there anything that she does that bothers you? When she calls me or asks me to, she doesn't just say, Hey, Seymour, would you do this? You just Seymour, real loud. And that you can't me. hear. <laughs> you know, it's well. true. <laughs> he has a hearing problem. So when I holler, he says, what are you hollering and for? You're taking it as an aggressive. Yeah. And I'm saying you don't hear me when I talk. So I'm talking loud. So when you're working through problems, what are you thinking? Solve it. He has this habit when he gets mad, he just walks away. Doesn't say anything, he yeah. goes. And I say, stay and fight it out. No, he doesn't want to. So when I start fighting it out, he walks out. And when he comes back, I figure he's cooled down and I've cooled down and I, I start the conversation up like yeah. nothing happened. Even if we've been fighting all day long. That's true. The next day is a brand new day. Yeah. I never say, you did such and such yesterday. It's over. Yeah. How do you make up? I don't know. How do we make up? We just... We just say, <laughs> oh, he'll usually kiss me and say, it's over. Forget about it. When it comes to relationships, I think about attraction and compatibility. And respect. The older I get, the more I realize how important that is. Do those ingredients factor in to how you see each other? Attraction, yeah. I've always felt that Shirley's very pretty. <laughs> right? And uh, even though she's 90 years old now, 
I am. So many people here, they just let the hair go white. Uh, she hasn't. And I still like to keep myself as, yeah. as best I can. I know a lot of people don't care anymore. They figure they've reached a certain age. But I always said, don't go out looking your worst. You never know who you're going to bump yeah. into. Do you still find him attractive? Yeah, I do. For a man 93, I think he's pretty good. Everybody is amazed. He goes out yeah. walking every day with the dog. And he walks faster than most people around here. And you can ask me all kinds of questions. And I, all I can really say is we were lucky. What's your favorite thing about Seymour? I guess there are a lot. I'm really, well, he's generous. He's always available. If anybody needs something, he's always there. He's always ready to help out. And he's easier to get along with that than me, I think. Mm -hmm. If I want something done and I'm afraid I'll lose my temper, I tell him to do it. You make the phone call. <laughs> You're better on the phone than I am. What's your favorite thing about Shirley? She's so considerate about everybody. She's just a, a kind person. She goes out of her way to make people feel wanted and if she sees somebody who who's sort of by themselves she'll invite them to have dinner with us she's just a sweet person thank you dear <laughs> it took you to bring out that nice <laughs> that nice saying so when you have an anniversary how do you mark it i don't get anything yeah. and he doesn't get anything yeah. i said if i needed it i would have it yeah. For this past one, he said, what do you want? I said, I'd like a card and flowers. <laughs> and that's what I got. Yeah. I don't need anything. If I want it, I go out and buy it. Fortunately, moving here has been the best move we've ever made. Once you move in here, you're here for life. And you die here. This and is the last bus stop. <laughs> yeah. God's waiting room. That's exactly yeah. what it is. Yeah. You said that people die here. This is yeah. This is where you settle in to really settle in. When you think about the end of your lives, do you talk about that? Like, do you go there? I know you. Yes. Yeah. We each want to go first. Yeah. Because he could do more things than me. I have a lot of balance problem. I need a cane or a walker. And he doesn't need that, that. And I just feel that if somebody has to go, I should go first. I, we do talk about it. And we don't look forward to it, but, you know, it's inevitable. I look at it a different way. He doesn't believe there's a hereafter. And I said, I believe it, otherwise I'd be scared to death. I feel there's some place... And maybe it's better than what we have here. And that's his belief, and that's my belief. Yeah. I just think it's the end of he going thinks, to sleep and never waking up. That's it. Now, so, you feel the way you do, and I'll feel the way I do. Yeah. I often wonder, what does happen to you when it's what do, over? What do you think? You, do, but you don't think we go poof. So what do you think? I don't know. I don't, I know you don't come back the same way. I know you're not going to get the same family and friends. Come back like my dog. <laughs> That's what he always says. I guess it's because I'm a coward and I'd rather think that there's some place else that you can go I know. instead of just disappearing. I used to be religious, then it became a and agnostic, and now I, I just don't, don't believe there's anything after you die. That's it. That's the end of it. I mean, listen, there's billions and trillions of people here. Where could where could they all go? <laughs> also, right. you know, we're going to be cremated. Our son who died, he was cremated. Our daughter's husband was also cremated when he died. So we had two deaths in three weeks. 
Yeah. April's husband died of cancer, and three weeks later, we buried our son. Our middle son, the one who, who became a juvenile, juvenile diabetic, he died of multiple myeloma. When we think about your marriage, did that was that a strain, or did it bring you closer, or something else? It brought us closer. Yeah. We felt we needed each other. Yeah. I couldn't sit down and talk to Bill. He was hurting himself because he and Larry were very close. They used to go fishing together, yeah. and they did a lot of things together. They were close. It was. It Bill, was, Bill really misses his brother Larry. Still does. Yeah. Probably always will. Yeah. Right. Sorry for your losses. You pick yourself up, and you go on. We've been very, very fortunate. Except for the couple of deaths, but everybody has something. Luck, just good luck. It's a big part of this. Yeah, oh, really. Yeah. So I hope you have a happy life. Thank you. Thanks to Shirley and Seymour Reitman. They live at Duncaster Retirement Community in Bloomfield, Connecticut, and we recorded that in March of 2019. And they're still going strong after 71 years of marriage. For this episode, I reached out to a lot of couples who weren't in same-gender partnerships, but it was really hard to find folks who are willing to talk. So if you are someone or know someone who's on the LGBTQIA plus spectrum and has been with their partner for over 50 years, I'd love to hear your story. Email me, cwolf at ctpublic.org. Audacious is produced by me and Katie Talarski at Connecticut Public Radio in Hartford to subscribe and listen back to previous shows about things like antinatalism, speech disfluencies, psychics, surviving animal attacks, what it's like to be a world-famous meme, or what it's like to not be capable of feeling any physical pain, visit ctpublic.org audacious. Send me your reactions and show ideas on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Kion Wolf, and online use the hashtag audaciouspublic. Thanks for listening. The number to call to support Audacious and all of the programming here on Connecticut Public is 1-800-584-2788 or go online to wnpr.org slash donate. I'm Katie Tolarski. I'm here with a senior producer of The Colin McEnroe Show, Betsy Kaplan. We wish we had tissues to give you because we know during this hour of reflections from couples who have been married for so long that was very emotional that was very it was touching it was beautiful and it made me think a lot about you know i've been married for oh gosh six years i think you know if the idea of being married for 50 years or more is feels crazy but it does like the fact that your relationship you know has so many different phases over the years it's interesting and, and you know kion is has a great way of getting those stories drawing those stories out of people through her um, curiosity and her excitement and again we hope you you are enjoying this programming we hope you enjoy this new show on connecticut public radio and call us and support us now 1-800-584-2788 or wnpr.org slash donate you know um, this station changes me and Kion's show is a perfect example of how that is. You know, none of us are the same people today that we were five years ago. We all change, you know, experience, age, circumstance, all that stuff changes us. And she talks to a lot of people who have gone through lots of changes and uh, experienced many things in life. So, again, we're changed by the ideas, the information, the culture that we absorb. So how much does that mean to you when you hear that on the station? And it's not just Kion's show. It's all the shows that we do, the local shows, the other national shows the news shows that we do, you may not know how much this station changes you, but consider what that's worth. And give us a call. Or first, I'm going to say WNPR.org is the way that you can contribute on the web or 1-800-584-2788. That's right. I think people who love public radio, they love, they're curious. They love to learn things. They love to, you know, they, they want to be the person at the, maybe at the dinner table who um, talks about all the, you know, what happened in the news today, what happened in politics, or a new fact you learn from, you know, listening to the Colin McEnroe show or whatever it is, or audacious. And that is why, you know, we love, you know, I personally love helping 
helping to produce these shows like Audacious and uh, the Colin McEnroe show, for example, just because, you know, I get to work with a group of curious people and we get to explore all of these different um, interesting issues and, and share them with our audiences. So again, if that's you, if you're, if you're interested, if you love this program and call us, support us, uh, please do it now. 1-800-584-2788 or go online to wnpr.org slash donate. And thanks so much.